All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I will give you a quick update on exam grades. I was hoping to have them back to you to hand you today. Um, but it turns out a lot of you, it takes a lot of grading. Um, but I do know from the first from the first half of the test, you match up really closely to last year's first half of the test. In their class average, the median was an 87.5 and the average was an 84. After five problems, your class average is an 86 and your, or sorry, your, your average is an 84 and your median is an 86. So you're really close to the last time I got this class. Um, I will have grades put in for you uh, by the end of tomorrow, and then I'll hand the uh, uh, test back to go in so you can see what happened and, and uh, how it went on Monday or Tuesday, depending on when I see you next. So, progress is being made. Sorry, I don't have them ready for you yet. It's just been a week. Um, so we're gonna start covering some new material today. Um, as promised, another fun thing that I've realized is I did the same thing with radiation dosage and biological effects last time I taught this class five years ago. We also didn't get to that before the test on the midterm. Um, because when I opened up this slide from five years ago, or this slide deck from five years ago, it starts with the biological effects of radiation, just like I was going to today. Um, so that also tells me we're about the same pace, which is kind of nice. Um, so we'll start by talking about biological effects of radiation, radiation sickness, how, how radiation, what the mechanism by which radiation damages cells, um, which means we also get to talk about the fact that microwaves don't harm your body whatsoever, neither do cell phones. Cell phones harm your brain, but that's that's more psychological, neurological than it is physical. Um, but so we'll talk, start by talking about um, biological damage. Um, so the, I guess before we get to that, um, the lab that we did today, I don't think we're going to do part B for it. So all you're going to do for this lab is uh, you're just going to turn in the pre-lab for this lab. And we'll call that good. Um, just because I don't, once you understand the logic, like, yeah, there's some good lab skills. You get to see how adding things, what these different types of precipitates look like. But there's not a whole lot of use to us spending a whole nother lab period on here's an unknown what's in it. Um, so we're gonna just just have you turn in the pre-lab as your as your assignment for this. Um, any any questions along that along those lines? Okay, so other things, uh, research project. From here on out, I'm gonna try and keep Monday, Tuesday is research project days, and Wednesday, Thursday are gonna be the actual lab exercises. So to make things easier for planning, I'm not gonna I'm gonna try and stop mixing up which day is which. Um, since that's that's kind of hard for you, for you all to deal with, um, understandably so. So, with that in mind, um, next Monday and Tuesday, I will be here in both lab sections as normal. Uh, there won't be an official assignment. It's just time to work on your um, on your research project. So you should be getting to the point where you have if you haven't started actually taking data or doing the experiments or procedure yet. Next week would be a good time to aim for start working on that stuff. You should have a pretty decent procedure in mind when you come in. Um, you don't want to show up with like people think, so what do we do? Um, so when you come in, if you want to make the most of that lap time, have a plan. Here's what we're trying to do today. Here's the procedure we want to test, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know how many of you have projects that you could do outside of the lab. Um, I know there's probably a few groups that you could actually, you could be working on these parts of your research projects on your own outside the lab. Um, but for anything that you need the lab, glassware, lab equipment, safety goggles, anything out of the stock room, um, that's why we have this time built into the schedule. So make use of it. All right, let's talk about radiation sickness because that's a fun topic. Um, so the actual mechanism by which radiation damages biological organisms is pretty straightforward. 
pretty much everything in everything living on Earth has the same basic structure. They're all made of cells, and those cells, for the most part, have a um, their genetic code in the form of the nucleus. Not every microorganism has a nucleus. Most of them do, but everything has a genetic code in some extent, right? Um, and that genetic code is stored in the form of DNA. DNA is really just a naturally occurring chemical hard drive um, that allows data to be stored. So what happens, what radiation actually damages is that raw material. You can imagine if, if you had a hard drive and somebody came into the hard drive with a super strong magnet and just wiped everything on your hard drive, um, that's not very good for you know preserving your data, right? Um, that's it's not as extreme, but radiation basically comes in and corrupts the data in the genetic code of in, of the organism, uh, and that it can have other effects too. But that's the primary and the most long lasting effect of radiation. Um, the Acute exposure, to which that's actually radiation sickness. And if you just get exposed to radiation once, but really, really intensely, it can have a lot of effects, um, but mostly just because it's killing cells. And when you kill a bunch of tissue cells, that's going to cause issues in your body. It's going to cause organ failure. It can cause um, immun immunological problems, things like that. Um, but most of those, if it's not an exceptionally huge dose, most of those your body can recover from eventually. Um, what your body really can't recover from very well is damage to the genetic code. Because once the information is lost, your body doesn't have a way of getting that information back. Luckily, every cell in your body has a duplicate code of the same genetic code. So it's unlikely that damaging that genetic code would cause your entire body to lose access to, to that information. It's not like you're going to damage the same bit of information in every cell of your body simultaneously. Um, but the way that this works is basically if it's the wrong mutation in the wrong cell, then you can wind up causing some issue with either, most commonly you get cancer cells. You get a tumor forming where basically the cell keeps dividing and has no way of turning off mitosis. Um, and just grows infinitely, or as long as it can, while while you are alive. Um, there are other things that can happen, other mutations that can happen, where basically there's some significant gene that that particular cell needs access to. If that gene gets damaged, then you can have other mutations happening. But the most common mutation by far is just going to be um, cause uh, cancerous growth. Um, and really, that's that's all it is. Is if you look at the radiation, if it hits the DNA, it knocks out the wrong cell or the wrong um, base pair. You can wind up with that trigger that causes unrestricted mitosis, and it just grows, grows forever. Um, but it has to be the right type of radiation. It has to hit the right part of the cell, and it has to hit the right part of the genetic code to do that. There are a lot of places in the genetic code where a mutation will cause a tumor to start forming. Um, so it's, you know, it's not like it's a, a one in a million shot. There's a lot of different possible types of cancer that can be caused or different parts of the cell that can cause, that can mutate to cause that. But you still need radiation that has enough energy that it can break apart that those base pairs or to cause some sort of weirdness to happen to the genetic code. Um, and then, and so that if it's if it's actually the radiation itself hitting the genetic code, that's what's called direct effect. It's literally the radiation itself, either the radioactive particles or the gamma radiation or X-ray radiation hitting the genetic code itself. Um, that's actually not how most of the mutations happen, though. Most of the mutations happen through indirect effect. Because if you, because there's a lot of water in your cells, obviously, right? Cells are made mostly of water. And if radiation hits water, you can wind up with 
um, turning that water into a molecule that is really unstable and then just goes out and reacts with salt. Um, and in that process, you can wind up creating a free radical. And free radicals are really dangerous for a couple reasons. Everybody's heard of the term free radical. Does anybody know what a free radical means? An oxidized. Um, why is this an oxidation reaction? It has an extra, or it's missing an electron, so it's got one and it wants to react. That's really close. It's most, most active, it's anything with an unpaired electron, especially any non metal with an unpaired electron. Metals are a little bit weird because those transition state, those transition metals have the D block, and sometimes you can have unpaired electrons with the D block, and that's not that unstable. Um, but if you ever wind up with a, with a non-metal that has an unpaired electron, that's a free radical. And so a lot of times we just write them like that. It's, you can't say that it has a charge necessarily, because if you look at the Lewis dot structure here, if you look at the formal charge on the oxygen, it still owns six electrons, right? It's sharing this pair of electrons, so that counts for one electron. It's got two lone pairs that it owns outright. That's five, and then it's got this one lone electron by itself. So it doesn't have a charge, but it has an unpaired electron. It has an incomplete valence, and that's really, really unstable for oxygen because oxygen is super electronegative, right? So oxygen is really good at pulling electrons towards itself. And so if you make a, an oxygen-free radical, it's going to go out and react with something, and it's going to go out and grab an electron from something. And if it grabs an electron from something, it creates another free radical in the process. So you wind up with this chain reaction happening, where until something, until you happen to have two free radicals bump into each other, you just keep producing free radical after free radical after free radical. And so that's a problem because if one of these free radicals happens to bump into the to a strand of DNA, it can cause the entire DNA strands to wind up reacting. Uh, and DNA has so many electrons in it that it can actually react with itself once it turns into a free radical. And that's a problem. It stops the free radical process, but it also means that that gene can no longer be replicated. It basically tweaks usually most commonly it's if you have two two t's in a row or is it two c's in a row i don't remember which one but basically if you turn a c into a free radical it's next to another c another cytosine those two cytosines can react together to fuse and instead of having something the genetic code that reads you know say a c c t u or u is an mrna excuse me uh g it was supposed to read like that. If these two fuse together, you get this A mess, and then TG. You can't read that. That doesn't mean anything to the to the the uh, enzymes that are supposed to translate this and turn it into mRNA. This big mess in the middle is now just worthless. And so that's one of the one of the ways that the radiation causes cancers is mainly by just causing these free radicals, which then go on to damage the genetic code when they, they happen to run into the DNA. So we've actually, given that our bodies are mostly made of water, and if you expose water to the right wavelength of light, this happens really easily. Um, our bodies have actually adapted to some extent. We have, they call it free radical scavenging. Um, enzymes. They basically are just enzymes that float around in your cells and wait for a free radical to be found. But when it finds a free radical, it has a way of neutralizing the free radical um, and rendering it useless. And so that's actually what an antioxidant is. Antioxidants are basically the vitamins that support those free radical scavenging enzymes. Um, they're basically, it's just allow, giving your body the raw materials to support those processes. Uh, so antioxidants are really, really good thing. They are, it, it is a real thing. It's not just a marketing term. Um, it, 
it's a little bit over over marketed um, for for how effective they are. Um, but at the same time, they are pretty good for you. Uh, and free radicals in general are are an issue. Even if you do your best to avoid things that cause free radicals, make sure you don't eat anything that has free radicals, things like that. Yeah, you know, don't put any plastic. People get really, really. Um, I don't want to say paranoid because there's small amounts of carcinogens in pretty much everything. Most of those carcinogens are in the form of free radicals. Um, so it's not a bad thing to be paying attention to, but you basically, there's no getting around the fact that you're going to have free radicals in your body at all times, just small amounts. We want to try to minimize it, but you can't get rid of them entirely because the number one source of free radicals in your body is actually cellular respiration. Breathing and anaerobic respiration in your cells, when you break down oxygen to produce CO2, which part of the electron transport chain produces, what is it, 90% of the ATP in your body is from aerobic respiration. Um, the process of breaking down the oxygen actually creates peroxides and peroxides break down to form free radicals. Um, so basically you can't avoid free radicals entirely. And just by the nature of breathing and the way that our cells work, you're going to get exposed to free radicals. And essentially, I don't mean, mean to be too much of a downer, but Everyone's going to get cancer. You live long enough, you're going to get cancer, period. Because nobody can get around breathing. Breathing oxygen is the number one carcinogen in the world. Um, so it's not worth necessarily being too picky about avoiding carcinogens in other places. Um, it's all about measured risk, right? Don't expose yourself to carcinogens needlessly, but at the same time, it's not you're never going to avoid all carcinogens. Um, that said, the other main place that you find free radicals on a regular basis is if you smoke anything, basically, burning something and then breathing the smoke in, the smoke has tons of free radicals in it. And so smoking anything, whether it's tobacco or marijuana or anything else, the act of just heating it up to the point where it burns um, will cause free radicals. And that's one of the reasons why it's thought that that vaping might be slightly healthier, but now we're finding there's other health effects associated with vaping that, that smoking gets away from. So basically, breathing in things is not usually good for your body, I guess is where we'll end that. Um, well, with the vaping, it's like the things that are added, right? The well, there's, there's that aspect of it too, but it's also the fact that you're taking tiny little droplets, like particles, particles and you bring them into your lungs. There's it's thought that that could, have, that could have an issue, even if there are no free radicals in them, it could cause, you know, still cause asthma and things like that, more lung-related diseases, even if it's less likely to give you cancer, less likely, not unlikely. Um, so I've heard things like when people quit smoking and after a number of years that their lungs can heal themselves somewhat, is that just a biological process of cleaning up the free radical damage? I don't know enough about that. The medicine aspect of it to say for sure. I do know that there are some tissues that the body will regenerate, and then there's some tissues that the body can't regenerate, and they're not always predictable. For instance, your gums. Your gums can't be regenerated, um, but and that's not one that you would think about because usually, like if you get, a, you know, you hurt your mouth, it heals pretty quickly. But apparently, not your gums. So I don't know, uh, lungs might be able to recover to some extent, but I think there's probably some levels that are that where it'll never recover fully. Yeah. Because the emphysema is permanent. There's no coming back from emphysema. Um, so. The cells do regenerate just very slowly. Very, very slowly. Gotcha. All right, so let's talk about if all radiation can, can cause this issue, we really have a problem. The thing is, it's not all radiation. When radiation, when light, hits a compound, what it's really doing is moving electrons from one energy level to a higher energy level, right? Like we talked about back when we started talking about quantum mechanics and, and um, you remember the lab where you made your spectrometer out of rulers um, and, the, um, and the tubes with uh, the different elements in them that all glow different colors. Um, all of the 
radiation does when it hits these compounds is it moves electrons to higher energy levels, right? But the energy levels required for this process to happen to make a free radical out of water or even out of peroxide, you still have to have a high enough energy. And that's why we, in, in, uh, if we're talking about radiation in terms of health effects, there's a really, really big divide between what they call non-ionizing radiation and ionizing radiation, which we can kind of, given the background I just gave you and the words, we can kind of see where this is going, right? Ionizing radiation means that the photons have enough energy that when you hit water or, or any organic molecule with it, you can wind up knocking an electron off and creating a free radical. Anything that's to the left of this line though, doesn't literally just doesn't have enough energy to promote electrons to a high enough energy level. So, and that means everything from, and that's why we have UV broken up into UVA and UVB. One form, there is a threshold where it's UV, meaning that it's a higher frequency than we can see with our eyes, but it's not high enough to be ionized in radiation. Uh, and then there's the other UV. I always mix up which one's which. Is UVA good or is UVB good? Anybody know? B. UVB is good? I think so too. Um, don't hold me to that, obviously. Nobody, nobody's going to tanning beds. Tahoe's not a big tanning town. Yeah. UVB is good. Is okay. So, yeah, basically tanning salons even don't really cause additional... Uh, risk of cancer because they predominantly use UVB, which is non-ionizing radiation. So there's other factors that why tanning beds are really not very good for you, but it's not because they cause cancer. It causes other tissue issues um, by being too tan for too long. Um, but everything in this direction is not going to cause cancer. And that includes, if you look Visible light, infrared, and then you get into the microwave down here, and then broadcast and wireless radio. Microwave, it's in the name. Microwave oven uses microwave radiation to warm up food by just literally just um, exciting the water molecules, except it doesn't have enough energy to cause them to ionize. So you're actually, in, you're not really increasing cancer risk by microwaving food, that's less of a concern than it used to be. People, when they first found out, it's, it says my, it's microwave radiation. You're putting radiation in your food. Um, yeah, but it's not that bad. It's the same type of radiation that your oven emits when it heats up food. Um, and then all the way down here, FM, AM, other types of radiation, those are all really low energy. So your cell phone uses predominantly radio waves, right? Which are even lower energy than your microwave. Yeah. They say that like it disrupts the endocrine system. Is that true? That blue light. That's not the phone radiation from the phone. No. I guess it is technically because it's radiation. Light is radiation, right? Um, but even like people like are weird about like Bluetooth, like headphones and stuff because it yeah. like emits. Those, I've, I've never seen any scientific evidence to show that that causes an issue. It's more the, um, the circadian rhythm can be thrown off, but if you've watched, if you look at a screen too late at night, it throws off um, your body because your body starts breaking down melatonin when it's supposed to be producing melatonin. Um, if, you, if you're exposed to blue light too late at night, but that's, even that's not really, is everything becomes a cancer risk far if you take it out enough steps. Um, but that's more about sleep deprivation, getting good quality sleep. Of course, being sleep deprived is also tied, correlated with increased cancer risk as well. So it's, so I guess if you take it that many steps removed, you could say that your cell phone could cause cancer, but it's not the radiation so coming from the cell phone. If you have your cell phone on you or like your laptop on your lap or something, it's not it's more just heat. emitting anything. No. There's a lot of misinformation about stuff like that. And, and you'll look down here, it even says power lines are way down here too. 
there have been some interesting studies about high high frequency power lines or high current power lines. Um, but the thing is, it's really hard to isolate correlation and causation because um, people that families that are living underneath um, power lines, especially the really high voltage power lines, um, that's typically also lower income families, right? If you have money, you don't choose to live underneath the high voltage power line. And so there's so many other impacts of poverty on health risks that you can't really separate. Is it the power line causing cancer or causing developmental issues? Or is it you're living under a power line because you're poor and because you're poor, you're also eating crappy food and it's the crappy food that's causing these developmental issues. Poverty is tied so many different ways. It's correlated with so many health issues. It's really, it's almost impossible to actually tease out what's causing health issues um, about living near power lines. With the 5G towers, it's that people were worried about on top of the buildings. Right, and that's not, those, there's been no evidence to suggest that 5G or any any radio towers, of any um, frequency that were, that is, well, all of them are well below ionizing level. So, in fact, the, the high voltage power lines have a better argument than the 5G. Because high voltage power lines do create a magnetic field, and you could you could come up with a hypothesis to say, okay, well, if a cell is trying to undergo mitosis in the presence of a really strong magnetic field, that that could cause the cell to have issues forming telomeres or pulling apart chromosomes could cause some issues that way. Um, but again, there hasn't been enough evidence to suggest that that's actually um, happening. You could just, it's its a hypothesis with no evidence to support it at this point. At least last time I checked, which probably was five years ago at this point. Um, so maybe more research has been done. Um, but it's not like 5G in particular got, you know, that was, that was, people got real weird about that for a while, right? Um, that really doesn't have any evidence to suggest, suggest that Wi-Fi or um, cell towers or anything like that has any effect on health. Like I said before, it's you're you're causing more health problems just by scrolling on your phone than the phone is physically causing, and that's more neurological than it is anything else. All right. Any other random radiation questions about? Yeah, Kyle. You just didn't um, hear about people say that like like leaving destroys the nutrients in your food or something like that. Is that remotely true? No different than heating it up on a stove or in an oven. Um, and in general, vitamins are fairly, fairly resilient molecules. And so most of the vitamins, there's not a whole lot to the whole raw movement. Um, if you are going to say that microwaving destroys the nutrients in the food, you'd have to go the route, say, cooking food destroys the nutrients in your food, which there's a better argument there. But most of the vitamins are going to be fine. It might there might be some foods that are better that where you get more health benefits if you eat it raw, but for the most part, it's there's not a whole lot to it. I read an article that said that it's like microwaving is like one of the healthier ways because it keeps because it's quicker, yeah. it heats it up quicker, so it like yeah, you don't like destroy as many nutrients in the cooking. You heat it up quicker and you're less likely to cause any carbonization, like you don't char it in the microwave, and that's actually the number one source of free radicals in your diet is a uh, burnt food. You don't burn food typically in the microwave, right? Which is too bad because a charbroiled steak tastes really good, but that blackened outside or the blackened tilapia, that kind of, like that blackened part is really bad for you. Um, it's both, that's a ton of free radicals mixed in there because you heated it up too much. And so with that, in that respect, yeah, microwaving is actually not healthy. Why does burning it make all these free radicals? Basically, you're just heating it up to the part where the molecules shake themselves apart. Okay. And if you, if you do that, when they split apart, some of them are going to split apart into free radicals. Okay. So just burning anything, and that's why smoking things is also going to cause free radicals. Um, and in general, avoiding burning or smoking things. But again, 
I mean, smoked food is really, really good. So it's right? removed salmon. So if it, it depends on how you do it, but in theory, there's some amount of free radical. Mostly that's all going to get, the free radicals from the smoke are going to react with the meat itself and, and cause mutations to happen in the meat, but the meat's no longer trying to replicate its tissue because it's, you know, yeah. dead. And so that's less of an issue unless it's smoked to the point that it's charred. At which point we're back to square one. Don't don't burn your food. Three radicals taste good. Three radicals taste good <laughs> in any different way. It's too bad. Brown is usually safe. Black is less so. So if it's mostly brown with a little bit of burnt black, you're probably fine. Yeah. Online does it that do the A, B, and C where A is the lower energy and okay. C is higher, so then A would be A would be say Yeah, exactly. Um yeah. And you know how they say infrared light's good for you? Like the red light therapy? I have not seen a whole lot, I have not looked into it. But I, I don't know a whole lot of evidence to support that. It feels good. It's warm. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. I have. It kind of sounds good to lay out under a heat lamp, right? It has to be like I do think it works because I have like this little device, but it has to be really high intense. Like it, like a lot of the masks and stuff don't have like enough intensity to actually do anything. And it's it's tough to isolate things like that and say the red light's causing is the red light stimulating some already occurring process in your in your body? Is your red light actually causing a chemical reaction? Is it just that it feels good because it's warm and when you feel good that produces positive results? Yeah. A little cold sore red light there yeah, pretty much and it really works. Well, I have not checked that one out. And it's FDA approved. Which I don't know. But I think it really works. Because FDA approved can just mean that the FDA hasn't banned it. It's FDA approved if it hasn't been banned. But if the FDA approves the health claims that they're making, that's different. That means that's legit for the most part. Um, so you have to read the fine print and be careful because the marketers will use, they will deceptively label things as just like, like, um, what was it that we were, my daughter was looking at, my daughter was like whipped cream. There was some, some can of whipped cream that said gluten-free on it in our fridge. My daughter looks like, why would whipped cream have gluten in it in the first place? It wouldn't, but because it's marketing, they can say, oh, it's gluten-free. It's not like they had to do anything to make it so free. The cream is always been free. Um, so anyway, watch out for marketing on 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 trends like that. Um, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to it. Just I don't see that. So I'll look we'll into it. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit more about how you measure radiation exposure. Um, and this is where it gets tricky. And each of these different um, variables, they use the acronym READ, radioactivity, exposure, absorbed dose, and dose equivalent, all have their own units. Um, radioactivity is the process we've actually studied. It's just in the units for radioactivity is basically how many, how many molecules, or how many atoms are breaking down per unit of time, unit per second or per minute. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, and so that's going to be more about what the material is, but it says nothing about how much energy is coming off when it breaks down. It says nothing about um, how much that, that type of radiation can just be blocked by various materials. So exposure is how much actually hits your skin. Absorbed dose is how much gets absorbed by your skin or by your, your tissues. And then dose equivalent takes into account that alpha particle exposure has different health effects than beta particle exposure, which has different health effects than x-ray exposure. And dose equivalent basically tries to normalize that so that you have one universal measure of radi radiation exposure, um, regardless of what the source of the radiation was. Uh, so 
Like I said, radioactivity is literally just measure the disintegrations per second. So if you've got a chunk of material that is, and that's that's what a Geiger counter is really registering, right? The clicks on a Geiger counter, it's registering how many disintegrations are happening. Um, how many, and really it's, it's how many particles are hitting the, the detector, but you actually have, you can work backwards from that to figure out, okay, based on the size of the material, how many disintegrations are happening per second. Um, and so these are the, the oldest radioactivity units, um, a Curie or a Becquerel, named after the two founders who first discovered radioactivity. Um, Becquerel was the, was the um, advisor when Marie Curie was in grad school researching radioactivity. So Becquerel discovered it first, remember the, the X-ray plate where you put the rock on top of it and then the rock accidentally developed the X-ray plate. Um, that was Becquerel. And then Curie, we are all familiar with that name. And so exposure then, it's a measure of the number of ions produced per volume. So this gets into the, um, both what the material is, what the type of breakdown is, and how many particles are coming out per unit volume, per liter, or per cubic centimeter, something like that. So that's, you can think of that kind of as like the density. Radioactivity is the mass. Then exposure is like density. It's normalized by the volume. Radioactivity is, is just a pure number. And so radioactivity is an extensive property, meaning if you have more radioactive material, there's more disintegrations per second. Exposure is intensive because it divides by unit volume. And then you've got absorbed dose. Have, yeah, and so units on that are rockgen, and I actually have no idea how to pronounce that. That's just the way that it sounds the best. I've never actually heard that word pronounced um, because it's not really a unit people use that often. Usually you see um, Curies or Becquerels reported, or you'll get RADs, which is what we're headed to in dose equivalent. You don't really see these middle two used very often in even in pop culture or anything like that, um, unless you're working in in a nuclear environment, um, which um, you or anything mostly in rads probably or in rad and siever rad and siever and sievers are the dose equivalent, which we'll get to in a second. I thought rads were, but rads are an absorbed dose, um, and so this is. Not just how much, how many ions are produced or how many charged particles are produced, it's how many are then absorbed into a tissue. Um, or in, it says a sample, but we don't really look all that often at radiation going into, say, a desk or something like that. But in theory, you could measure how much radiation is absorbed into a desk as well. Um, usually we talk about it more in terms of tissue. Um, and so that also gets takes into account what the material the sample is made of, which makes things a little bit a lot more complicated, not a little bit more complicated, because metal is going to absorb radiation differently than wood, which is going to absorb radiation differently than water, which is going to absorb radiation differently than bone. Right. And so the type of tissue and what the sample is made of factors into absorbed dose as well. Um, and again, the gray, I think, is a, is a more archaic unit. Now, rad, radiation absorption, is the more common unit for this, for this variable. And yeah, seabirds are down to dose equivalent. Um, so it's just a, a, uh, an example of um, what they call penetrating power of different types of radiation. It's like a piece of paper will block an alpha particle. But a beta particle move through a piece of paper through your hand will be blocked by metal. Neutrons will move through all of those, but a large enough glass of water, a large enough piece of uh, uh, large body of water will absorb it, will block it. When we say block, it's not like they're hitting these and bouncing off. They're being absorbed by these and incorporated into the material. 
And so that's where that radiation absorbed dose comes into, comes into play. Um, concrete will block pretty much all radiation other than really high energy light. So gamma radiation and X-rays can still move through concrete, um, but a large enough chunk of lead will block those as well. What about a large enough chunk of concrete? Large, so all of these are based on just how big they are, right? Because your hand is not all that different than a glass of water, right? Mm-hmm. Your hand's thinner than a glass of water. Um, and so it's more about if you get a big enough, a big enough piece of paper is then really just plank of wood, right? But if you get big enough, any of these can block any of these types of radiation. Um, this is more just for context. And that's actually one of the ways that they've looked at um, that they've looked at a mission, a mission in between planets that had humans on it. You'd need to protect the humans on the inside from the radiation from the sun, right? From the really high energy particles. And we talked about how generating magnetic field around the, the ship would be one example for one approach. Another one would be to put all of the drinking water all of the water for the, the ship in a shell around the living quarters so that you just have this big water tank between the high energy particles flying off the sun and where you're, the humans are spending most of their time. So if you make it big enough, then any of these will work. And I think in the, in, in the International Space Station and most of the stuff that's built on the ground and then launched that's also for a human um, humans living there. They use they, they don't use lead because lead is so heavy. They use a more they use more dense alloys than lead to make like a foil that they use to shield it. I think most of them are gold based. If you see that gold foil on the outside of space stations or just in, in general, a lot of times that's actually radiation shielding um, because metal right so basically the, how dense the metal is is going to limit how much of the metal you need the more dense the metal the less of it you need the thinner you can make that sheet which means the less overall um, mass that you have to launch into orbit um, but water would also be a really good candidate because it absorbs most types of radiation pretty well um, and you're going to have to bring a whole bunch of water with you if you're traveling to Mars anyway, so you might as well use it as a radiation shield. Um, we see the same thing, similar type of graph here. Uh, alpha particles, tip, they can cause a lot of tissue damage, but mainly just on your skin. They don't penetrate very far into your body. And so they're less likely to cause cancer, actually, but they're more likely to cause burns. You still wind up with it hitting your skin and having a ton of extra energy in your skin, but it's less likely to make it into the parts of your body that are actually going through ongoing mitosis. And those that's when you wind up with tumors happening. Um, beta particles can move through the top few layers of skin, um, but can't make it through muscle, really. But alpha particles, Go right through everything. Or sorry, um, gamma radiation goes right through everything. Yeah. Uh, back to like the water blocking mm -hmm. the radiation. Would it still be safe to drink that water? <laughs> Given a little bit of time for the water to react with itself. Yes, because if you make those those free radicals by hitting it with a whole bunch of radiation, those free radicals are really reactive, right? But if you then allow that water a chance to react with itself and go back to being normal water instead of free radical water, then it'd be safe to drink again. So you would have to do some sort of like, okay, the stuff that's going to be for immediate consumption gets put in the same protective area as the, as the humans are living in. And then, but the bulk of the water is present on the outside. You basically just need like a holding penny before you, before you drink it. When you say the gamma rays can go in through everything in the body, that means, but are you saying that that is interacting with the organs at the deepest level, or is that it's passing through and it's inert? Both. Okay. So it's it's a it's a probability game. It's a statistics game. Most of the radiation will go right through your body, but the fact that X rays exist shows that it doesn't go through everything at the same rate, right? 
That's why you can see bones on an x-ray because the bones not necessarily absorbing the x-rays, but it's, it's absorbing some of them and it's deflecting others because the more high dense material in your body will do that. Um, it's, so a good chunk of it goes right through, some of it gets absorbed, some of it gets, gets scattered and goes other, other directions. Um, and that's why it's not like if you get exposed to x-rays, you're gonna get cancer immediately. It's more of a long-term thing. It's a probability thing. And then last but not least, dose equivalent, um, REMS or Sieverts, Bronchet equivalent man. So basically they started looking at, remember bron Bronchet was exposure. Um, and so it, they, are some, they made some assumptions where they were able to say, okay, assuming the size of a man is this, um, and there's this many Bronchets happening, how many of them are actually absorbed and causing damage? Um, with the, and this one really is a med is goes all the way into um, how much damage is done, and that so that takes into account radiation type, how intense the radiation was, tissue type. Um, putting your hand, getting your hand exposed is going to give you a different number of sieverts than getting your heart exposed, for instance. Um, and so this is really more on the medical side looking more at sieverts and then and that's all also kind of like a cumulative thing if you look at um a lot of astronauts in particular but anybody who works in in a uh, field where radioactivity is an issue you'll have sort of like a lifetime count sometimes and usually that's done in terms of sieverts um and especially for astronauts there's like a hard line where after you get above a certain number of lifetime sieverts you can't go back into space anymore um, because you're basically, you're dramatically increasing your risk of cancer happening really, really soon once you get above a certain threshold of, of lifetime exposure. Doesn't your bone density like get affected? By being in space or by radiation? Be both. Differently, but um, bone, so we don't really know much about the effects of low gravity on on our physiology. Um, bone density is one of the issues. That's why they have the um, they have them do exercises in space. Um, and then when they get back home, it takes them a really long time to get back to normal bone density. Uh, and they might it might be one of those things that never fully recovers as well. Um, but that there's not a whole lot of research. We don't know enough about it because we have really, really small sample size. The number of people that have been in space long enough for that to be an issue is like, you know, double digits, but definitely not triple digits. And that's not a big enough sample size to really be able to make too many conclusions. One of the most interesting ones was those with those twins, where one of them went on the International Space Station for a year, the other one stayed on Earth. They were identical twins. They were both in good shape and had the same exercise regime beforehand. Uh, and then they looked at, at the difference in their physiology when, when the one who was in space came back. And I think that was the one who set the record for the longest time in space. Um, it was something like a year in a year in change that he spent on the International Space Station in one go. When he came back, he had markedly different bone density and I think height too. I think he was taller than his twin who had spent time on Earth, but also had lost a ton of muscle density. So he wasn't as strong. He could barely walk for a long time. Um, yeah, he can't walk. Even they have like centrifugal treadmills, that kind of thing, but it's still not the same as true Earth gravity. Interesting. So we and we we really have no idea what it would be like, you know, longer term than that. Or like, what's the moon's gravity versus Earth's gravity? How is that going to affect like tissue development or things like that? Um, have I talked about The Expanse in here? Have I mentioned that one? Really good TV show, but even better series of books um, about, about uh, what it would look like if, when, if humanity colonized various parts. It actually made some guesses as to what the physiology difference would be 
um, would somebody born and who grew up on the moon be able to come to Earth? Or would the gravity just be too much for their muscles and bones if they're developed in low gravity? Um, really interesting thing, the stuff that they looked at. All right, before we take our break, last thing about, oops, forgot about those. Um, so this chart is uh, done by one of my fav favorite science educators who wanted to just give give it um, context graphically for what different radiation exposures look like. Because like I said before, you can't avoid all radiation. Um, and if you look at the units on these, these are in sieverts, right? So these are in that, that uh, um, dose equivalent. Um, if you live within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant for a year, it's 0 0.09 microsieverts. Eating one banana, is more microsieverts because potassium, all potassium is slightly radioactive. Um, and so just eating a banana actually has more sieverts than living within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant. It was, it was weird. Um, and there was actually, there's actually a, um, a joke unit, you know, physicists like to come up with, they, they like to make jokes with their units sometimes. Um, where they would actually rate how much your radiation exposure in units of bananas. <laughs> so, yeah, in one arm x ray is 10 bananas of exposure, um, is one microsiever. Using a CRT monitor, nobody uses CRT monitors anymore, but those are the big boxy ones, right? Um, they anybody grow up with those and get told, sit, don't sit too close to the TV because it's bad for your eyes? because it actually is firing electrons at the back of the TV. And some of those go through and you actually wind up absorbing them into your retinas that way. Um, modern TVs don't have that issue. So that, that argument doesn't hold up with kids today. Kids today can sit as close as they want. You can't say it's bad for their eyes. You just have to say you're, you're in the way. <laughs> it's being like statically. Yeah, so that, that are generated, they literally work by firing electrons okay. and they use magnetic fields to direct the electrons into certain areas. And when those electrons would hit the right phosphors, what they called them, the right pixel, it would light up for a second. Um, that's why the oldest, older TVs too, they would like glow for a second after you turned them off because you were just, they would have like that after image for a second. Um, that's basically just waiting for that luminescence to stop fluorescence to stop. Um, dental x-rays are worse than, than arm x-rays, which also kind of makes sense, right? Because you're putting the energy into your brain instead of into your arm. There's more tissue here to absorb. Um, an airplane flight from New York to LA is 40 microsieverts. And then I like this one too. Using a cell phone, zero microsieverts. A cell phone's transmitter does not produce ionizing radiation. It does not cause cancer unless it's a banana phone. <laughs> you guys remember banana phones, right? They're shaped like a banana. It's, never mind. Uh, living with this was also interesting too. Living within 50 miles of a coal power plant is. More three energy. times more radiation exposure than living next to a nuclear power plant because burning coal produces free radicals that smoke even if they capture most of it it's still some of it gets released into the atmosphere um and, and actually us living at altitude we actually get more microsieverts from just being outside and living at altitude than we would from living next to a coal, coal power plant or a nuclear power plant And then if you take all of the blue doses together, it's about 60 microsieverts, which is left, which is a little bit more than one chest X-ray. Uh, year, yearly dose from natural potassium in the body. Like I said, you can't get away from radioactivity to some extent. You get 390 microsieverts just from the required amount of potassium. You need to eat potassium for your body to work. But in doing so, you're getting 390 microsieverts a year. Just like how a mammogram 
Just like checks you for cancer, but then also, but also could be causing cancer. Yeah. <laughs> It's all about managing risk, right? Um, EPA yearly limit on radiation exposure for a single member of the public. Basically, you want to stay under one millisieverts per person per year. Above that, the, the EPA has to step in and regulate things. Um, and maximum external dose from Three Mile Island accident with only one millisievert. Still not even that strong. Maximum yearly dose permitted for U.S. radiation workers, 50 millisieverts. So if you're actually working on a nuclear power plant or a nuclear sub or anything where you're working with nuclear materials, they also have a maximum yearly dose that's permitted. Chest CT, dose for spending an hour at Chernobyl. Well, varies wildly, but still less than what's permitted in a yearly dose for someone working in a power plant. Normal yearly background dose, 85% is from natural sources. Nearly all of the rest is from medical scans. Interesting. Uh, and then we get into the big ones. These are the ones that are likely to start causing like immediate health effects. Um, all of the green doses together is 75 millisieverts. Total dose at one station at the northwest edge of the Fukushima exclusion zone, 40 millisieverts. Then there's some. Would that like would that give you like radiation sickness kind of like immediate like yeah, you start with your tissue, your organs stop functioning if you give them this much radiation because the tissue starts dying. Um, and a lot of that can be recovered, although you're still at greater risk for cancer long-term because you can't get around the fact that, you, that cancer is tied to all these long-term. The acute doses start showing up when you start getting into the orange ones here. There, oh, there is dose causing symptoms radiation poisoning is received in a short time, 400 millisieverts, so about that much. Um, severe radiation poisoning, usually fatal radiation poisoning, about four sieverts. Um, fatal dose even with treatment. They call that walking dead. Basically, if you get exposed to enough radiation, your body doesn't die immediately, but enough tissue is dying that it's never going to be able to come back from it. Your body's dying, but your brain's not dead yet. Um, and so until all of your organs fail, you're still walking around, well, maybe walking around, probably bedridden for most of it. Um, probably pretty unpleasant. Um, lots of intense pain but you're still technically living, even though you've got like, it's um, it's uh, not a whole lot of uncertainty. You're going to die in the next three days, basically. Um, but, and there's nothing you can do. You think there would be a foul smell because like your insides are kind of rotting away, right? I mean, have you spent time with someone who's dying? Yeah, there's a lot of foul smells. I don't think that there's a good way to die that doesn't involve foul smells. Yeah. A nice campfire. Nice campfire. Yeah. <laughs> well, get some free radicals. Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> and then last but not least, 50 seabirds, 50 full seabirds, 10 minutes next to the Chernobyl reactor core after the explosion and meltdown. So definitely anything, anybody who was in that immediate area um, was exposed to fatal amount of radiation pretty quickly. Disclaimer, um, it's for general education only. If you're basing radiation safety procedures on an internet paying image and things go wrong, you have no one to blame but yourself. So your mileage may vary. Don't take this as gospel. This was just made by a guy who writes comics for fun, for a, a living. So um, go do more research if it's something that's relevant to you. Don't make any decisions based on this graph. All right, let's let's take our break. Um, I'll leave this up there. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because it's not a biology class, but if you're interested in radiation sickness, there's this. Let's come back at 10 after. And we'll start talking about geology a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> 
We'll notify your DNA, like, hey, let's release this. Let's make more of this. And that makes it easy. So, it's like the same, but um, my question is like the same, is the same thing that's burning your skin the same thing that causes cancer, or is that more of a so randomized, like if you're getting hit by a certain amount of parts? So, you can be burned without something being ionizing radiation. Like the, the intensity is high enough. You can be burned just by high off. Burned by a heat lamp, right? it doesn't do yeah. anything in the in the visible region. Um, so it's a little bit more so within that. You have to factor in the intensity of it, and because burns really get caused by the denaturing of proteins in your skin and in your cells, mm -hmm. and that can happen a lot of different ways. It's primarily, pH and temperature are the two main ways that denature proteins. And so, as anything that raises your temperature above a certain threshold can burn you, but it might not cause melanin release and it might not cause cancer. So, that's more specific to the amount of UVB large particles. Exactly. Being flung your way. Right. And, and even a burn can still be carcinogenic, even if it didn't have any ionizing radiation, because it causes additional cell replication, right? Your cells have to work over time and go through more mitosis cycles to fill in to produce more new skin cells, right? Mm -hmm. Every time you go through a mitosis cycle, there's a chance that you're going to cause a, a tumor. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small chance in most cases, but anything that increases right. tissue growth, it, that increases your risk of cancer as well. Child, or carrying a child um, increases your chance of getting cancer because uh, because your body gets exposed to tons of hormones that cause increased tissue growth. And so you wind up, even with something just like a pregnancy, increases your cancer risk just by virtue of more mitosis means more chance for tumor. And what was the deal with the sun? Was sunscreen did it kind of absorb the UV particles? It basically, when the UV hits, um, the molecules and so it does the same thing it would do in your body, except it, we allow, it gets absorbed by molecules that aren't in your body. And it has those molecules have lots of pathways for the high energy photon that it gets produced to fall down the lower energy level just by burning of um, increased vibration, increased heat, basically. So it converts one big photon to a bunch of heat vibrations. So you'll still warm up. From getting hit by that photon, but you won't. Um, it won't. Be, it basically takes the ionizing radiation and turns it into non-ionizing radiation. Interesting. It is. We have the tools to talk about that. Now. The vocabulary to be able to talk about that. Um, now that we've taken this this section, smart, right? Educated. Anything. I know. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I remember thinking that this wasn't how I thought it was like. Like, I thought it was a lot of people. You know, like that. You, you, you know. <laughs> and then, yeah. <laughs> You're writing this like right at the end of the slide. Is that what? You just look at it and like zoom out, and it's just like that's like no yeah. word. Yeah, you know, like my brain is doing that. <laughs> I'm taking that on the line of the floor. I don't know. 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 I
And so, like I said, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, on the radiation sickness. This is in the biology class, and it's a, um, a bit of a downer. Um, but one thing I just want to point out here, just because it's really fascinating to me, is that above a certain number of REMS, radiation exposure can cause loss of consciousness. But there's, as far as I'm aware, we have no idea why, what the mechanism is, what's being disrupted. It's not like losing consciousness because you've gotten hit on the head. I guess maybe it is like getting hit on the head um, where it's just caused um, you know, a bruise on your brain, basically. This is like if you absorb too much at once. Too, too much, much at once. How much is it? Is so this is this is in units of REMS, but this would be like standing next to a nuclear reactor that was not shielded. Oh, so it's like, like not not the normal course of things. But it's just weird to think about what the mechanism. How how would it be possible that just exposure to radiation could cause you to lose consciousness, cause your brain to stop? Um. What is it? It's, just, it's interesting to me because the nature of consciousness is interesting to me. So it's interesting to think about what it is about radiation with the loss of consciousness. And consciousness is basically just your neurons talking to each other. Well, if it's like destroying much stuff in your body, like all at once, if you're standing, you're absorbing a ton of that. Couldn't it just like do something crazy, like just drop your blood pressure and like that could knock you out? I suppose, it, I suppose it could be much more than that. From my understanding, and again, it's not a doctor. Um, I don't think it's tied to any other physical phenomenon. It, it's basically like you lose consciousness without any, it's, it's kind of like, like you know, you're there and then you're not. And it's weird to think that radiation could cause that because what is what process is it disrupting exactly? That's the interesting part to me. Um, but then again, I just find consciousness fascinating in general. So when you say lose consciousness, you mean like it just knocks you out, knocks you out. It's a Can weird a microwave thing. do that? What's that? Can a microwave do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen to Sydney. Bring to this section right here. You that the cell phone. <laughs> That does not cause the <laughs> <laughs> seabirds to be absorbed. Yeah, how many bananas do you stand next to? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. If you live under a banana tree, <laughs> live under a banana tree. Is that better or worse than living next to a nuclear power plant? Or toilet. Uh, they are birds. They are on no bubbles. The birds aren't real. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> They're government birds. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about geochemistry and talk about just and how, how different materials work. So um, just really on conceptual terms, we're not going to do a whole lot of math with it. And there's really not even a whole lot of like, like skills to take away from. Like for, for you know kinetics and radioactivity, there was like, well, What's, you know, use the half-life, calculate this. There's not even a whole lot of that we can do with a lot of the material we have from this chapter, but I kind of want to just go through it just because that's it's kind of cool. And those of you who are into geology, hopefully we'll get something useful out of it. Um, again, another disclaimer, not only am I not a medical doctor, I'm also not a geologist, nor have I taken a geology class before. So feel free to correct me, those of you who have taken some geology classes, if I say something wildly out of line. Um, I'm going to stick to something I don't think you cover in geology, so hopefully you won't catch me when I screw up. But please let me know if you do. Um, does this graph look familiar? No. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so a lot of what we're going to talk about in this chapter is has a lot to do with orbitals, orbital energies, and how orbitals interact when you when you bring or you make covalent bonds and bring atoms close together. So I really just it has like um, you know a review question: fill in the appropriate number of electrons. If everybody remember how to do that? What's the rule for adding the electrons? They need to be filled. Fill fill up 
They're like 2P111. Yeah, start at the bottom though, right? Yeah. Fill up the first row before you go to the next level, right? So that's that. That was what uh, is called the Aufbau principle. And if you speak German literally, it means to build up, I believe, right? Um, and that just means you start at the bottom and go from there. You don't start at the top of a building. When you start building a building, you start at the foundation and go up, right? Um, yeah, you start at the bottom, you fill both of these, um, an electron up, spin up, spin down, and then you can move to the next one, right? And you fill the whole thing up. You fill one into each of these before you start doubling them up, et cetera. And then you just go on until you run out of electrons, right? So basically, you're going to fill up from the bottom up because it's, you're going to put your electrons into lowest energy states first before you start putting them into the higher energy states, which again, makes sense. If you put an electron into a high energy state, it's going to fall back down into a low energy state if there's a room available. Um, and this is just a reminder of how the periodic table is built up and how the different orbital locks work on the periodic table. Everybody remember? S block, D block, D block, F block. Um, the uh, we've talked about metals a little bit, especially when we talk about crystal structure. When you learn crystal structures, BCC versus simple cubic versus FCC, that was mainly just looking at metals. Right. Do you remember it was always like, okay, zinc forms this type of crystal structure. What's the lattice constant? Remember doing those calculations, the geometry of it? All of those were just looking at metals predominantly because crystal structures of binary of ionic compounds are a lot more complicated. And we're going to look at some of them today. We're not going to spend a ton of time on them. We're not going to calculate anything. We're going to go back to some of those concepts, though, you didn't sell. Um, and predominantly, we're going to spend today on what's called the main group elements, which is just the P block, um, focusing mostly on carbon and silicon. A little bit of oxygen, too, because you can't get away from oxygen. Um, and so those are what are referred to as the main group elements. Basically, Everything to the left of that is all metals, right? So all of the, the non-metals, but then there's that stair-step line. So these are technically metals, um, but they're in the P block. All of those together are collectively called the main group elements. Um, so why do we focus on silicon and carbon? Well, carbon we care about because we're made out of carbon. Um, so we have a vested interest in knowing how carbon behaves for that reason. Um, silicon, because most of the earth is made of silicon, at least most of the earth's crust. Um, silicon and oxygen make up together, make up, what is that, about 75% of by mass of the earth's crust are made up of silicon and oxygen. Um, of course, that's leaving out water, but even if you included water, then the oxygen share only goes up. But it turns out water is actually a really, really small chunk. Um, but if you look at by mass, even as big as the oceans are, the Earth's crust is much, much thicker. And so in general, um, most of the Earth we can think of as being made of silicon and oxygen, other than the core. Um, and so when you put silicons and oxygen together, you get a class of molecules called silicates. And so what we're gonna talk about as far as these different materials is looking at different types of these silicates because almost all minerals are silicates. Maybe not all gemstones, but that's part of the reason why they're more rare is because they're not silicon and oxygen. But mo again, by mass, most of the Earth's crust is silicon and oxygen. So most of the rocks that you see, most of the minerals you see are going to be silicates. Um, and some of them are pretty cool too. The you know, gemstones are cool and everything. A lot of gemstones are made out of aluminum anyway, um, and which is also fairly common. The simplest form is called silica. The simplest silicate is silica. Makes sense, easy enough. 
Um, silica is just SiO2. So it's like carbon dioxide, but with silicon instead of carbon. Um, and it, except it, you wind up with, with a couple different forms of it. If you wind up with it in a crystal structure, you actually wind up with the silica um, being in a tetrahedral shape. Even though it's SiO2, it's not going to turn into CO2, where it's this linear double with pi bonds. SiO2 is the crystal structure, is the formula, even though it's really got every silicon is actually bound to four other oxygens. It's just that each one of those oxygens is bound to another silicon. And so you, you wind up with, and that's called a, a molecular solid. The molecular solid just means that it's one giant molecule. It's not like it, it's a, um, the phase changes are going to be super different than say like water melting because water is a, is a crystal structure that's made up of a whole bunch of discrete molecules. Yeah, there's attractive forces, but they're still separate molecules at the end of the day. Silica and quartz are basically one giant molecule more like a diamond than like water molecules, right? But also different than say metals where everything is the same atom. So then to get different types of quartz and stuff, is it just like different combinations of the- Different combinations, different impurities most often. Um, glass is silica as well. It's just not crystalline silicon. It's close to a crystalline structure, so, but if you if you look at if this is the perfectly repeating crystal structure um, made of a bunch of different unit cells, you can imagine how just having like one in one spot where you're missing an oxygen, you actually have two silicons bound to each other. That's called a, a defect in the crystal structure. Or like going back to the metal structures you were looking for. If your regular crystal structure is body centered cubic. But then every one out of every thousand unit cells is missing that that sphere in the middle. And so it's just an empty, simple cubic unit cell in the middle of a much larger BCC structure. Those are those defects. Um, if you have too many of those defects, it loses its crystalline structure. It's not considered a crystal anymore. They call that an amorphous solid. And so that's why, if you've ever heard that, well, glass is really a slow-moving solid, not really a, not really, or a slow-moving liquid. It's not really a solid. No, it's not really a crystal. It's still a solid. It's not a slow-moving liquid. It's just an amorphous solid, meaning it's lacking a lot of this perfect crystal structure. It's got a lot of imperfections in it. The only difference between like crystal glassware that you or crystal stemware, whatever. Um, that your you know your parents keep with their fine china. Um, the only difference between that and regular glass is it's got better crystalline structure to it. It's still silica. It's still just quartz, um, but it has fewer defects in it. And the more defects means it has less of a clean transition state when it go or um, phase change when it goes from solid to liquid. It's like glass softens when it gets hot. And gets, it starts to sort of behave a little bit like a liquid as you get close to the melting point. The more, the more crystalline your quartz is, the more it's going to have a really clean, well-defined phase change when you get to that melting point. And so there are some, some weird aspects to it. Um, but sand is silica, glass is silica, quartz is silica. Different types of quartz just have different types of defects or have different things mixed in. If every hundred, out of every hundred silicon atoms, if one of them was an aluminum, say, that's gonna give it a different color. And that it, just depends on where you're located. And that just depends on where you're located. And that's why you're looking, like, you find rose quartz in areas that are high in iron, I think, and, but you find amethyst, which is also just quartz. Um, in areas that have more magnesium, maybe calcium. I don't remember. Again, my ge geology is shoddy at best. Um, but basically, that's why you get different like concentrations of types of quartz. Everything is predominantly silicate, but whatever the tiny little impurities are that get mixed in, or would give the different types of quartz different colors. And same with um, 
gemstones too. Uh, I believe it's, I think ruby and sapphire are both aluminum oxide crystals. Um, the difference is the, is the imperfections one type of imperfection gives it a blue color and the another type of imperfection gives it a red color. Really the only difference between a ruby and a sapphire. Um, so with like sedimentary rocks, like it's because of like volcanic underground like action. Sedimentary means it comes or, from sand. No, I meant igneous. Igneous, okay. Like, so igneous like comes from internal, like, and that's like, or, or granite. Mm -hmm. So it's like all of that, like from the magma has all of those compounds in it or? or like yes, magma, and, and but the rate of cooling has a lot to do with it as well. And what it's gonna form. Right, the slower it cools down, the more crystal structures you form because you allow things to sort of separate out on their own. If you cool it down really, really quickly, everything is still exactly. well mixed. And you wind up with it being being less pure and less crystalline structure to it. Um, but yeah, at its at its I don't want to say at its core, um, but at basic level, all of that is just melted glass with just different inclusions. And those different inclusions are going to determine what type of rock is formed when it cools down. Different, I guess, different types of inclusions and the rate of cooling will turn it determine what type of rock. But pretty much all of those rocks are silicates. Um, here's an example of some alumino silicates. So in some of their lattice sites, like I mentioned, you get an aluminum substituted for a silicon, which changes the crystal structure. And it happens if it's a nice, clean crystal structure. Um, then it's happening at a relatively consistent ratio. It's not like you've got a bunch of aluminums here and then all of your silicons there. It's like, okay, here's 50 in a row that are silicon, then an aluminum, then another 50 in a row that are silicon, and then an aluminum. Um, when they're nice and uniformly distributed like that, when they're nice and homogenous, you get nice homogenous crystals or nice homogenous materials as well. Um, so also we're pointing out that Basically, all of our rules about uh, coming up with ionic compounds and covalent compound formulas go out the window when we start talking about geology. Um, these formulas for geology, these molecular formulas, are really weird compared to the rules we've seen so far. Like, albite here is a pretty simple one. It's NaAlSi3O8. That doesn't follow any of our rules for how we would, like, come up with a formula based on... on ionic bonds or covalent bonds or anything like that, right? Because geology in the real world is, is complicated and you wind up with these mixtures. We don't like dealing with these mixtures, these really complicated structures in the lab because they're less predictable. Um, they don't, it's harder to make generalizations about these really complicated systems. So we don't tend to see them in lab settings very often, at least not in chemistry labs. Um, like other than Labrador, I, albite and orthoclase, I don't think have much in the way of like they're they're useful to be able to identify them if you're a geologist. And I'm sure that Scott will tell us more about how they're formed with the differences in, in how they're formed. Um, but they're not they're not like sexy mineral. They're not like they don't have a lot of use that we're aware of or necessarily. It's just that. Here's some examples of your crystal structures. So when you were saying like, this is not like normal, like a structure, how do they start like just figuring it out? Like, do they do like process of elimination of like, yeah, you know, things that like precipitating? So basically most of these rocks will dissolve on, with the right, with the right um, acids. And so once you get them all the way to dissolve, you can start doing tests like we did in lab. Where you can say, okay, well, I know that I proved conclusively we have aluminum in this mixture. I proved conclusively we have sodium in this mixture. And then you can go back and say, okay, and you can work backwards from that and figure out uh, relative concentrations to get these formulas. That, like that when you were first learning about molecular formulas, you were just like, okay, well, there's a material that's 90% or that's you know 72% nitrogen and 10% oxygen and 10% hydrogen or something. 
you can work out what the formula was from that, right? Um, tests like what we did today, if you then take it and actually do some of the quantitative parts to it to figure out how many moles you have, allow us to work backwards to find these formulas. Um, these aluminosilicates, if you have an extra positive ion, so like I said, the reason these, these get complicated formulas um, is because if you, if you have a silica and you start putting aluminum into the lattice instead of silicon, you're actually going to throw in extra electrons by doing that. You might have the unit cell being negatively charged. When you do that, the, you have to have positive ion balance out the charge, and that's why you wind up with things like NaAlSi3O8. The Na is just there to balance out the charge, basically. Um, and some of them get even more complicated. So if it's Labradorite, it's calcium, sodium, silicon, aluminum, where your sodium and calcium are in a two to three ratio and your silicon and your aluminum are in a variable ratio, but there's always eight oxygens. Like how are you supposed to figure that out based on the raw theory? You basically can't without a whole bunch more experience in condensed phase um, physics and material science. Or, you go out into the field like a ge geologist and you say, well, I have a hard time predicting why it's doing this, but I can figure out without a shadow of a doubt that this is the formula. And I know that this is Labrador, right? Um, even if it, trying to reconcile field samples with the theory gets a little bit dicey sometimes because it's pretty complicated. Now, if you start linking together silicates, you actually can wind up with polyatomic ions called orthosilicates. Um, if you just have an SiO4, you get a negative four charge. We haven't done much with silicates as a polyatomic ion, but we know how polyatomic ions work, right? So you start basically making ionic compounds with silicates. We start seeing some of our other types of, of uh, minerals. Um, if you take two of them, the same, same way that you can have chromate or dichromate, everybody remember the difference in the formula? Of course you do, right? Versus Cr2O7 for the two minus. Pyrosilicates are the same thing with silicate. You take two silicates and you have them share one oxygen. You go from SiO4 with a negative four charge to Si2O7 with a negative six charge. But basically, so there's a whole family of polyatomic ions based around silicates. Um, and sometimes you can wind up with this extending. So pyrosilicates are just are this formula right here. But if you if you continue that idea and you basically it's kind of like making a unit cell, a crystal structure, but in only in one dimension, where it just extends infinitely in one dimension but it doesn't go up and it doesn't go forward and back. It just goes in one straight line. You get a chain of silicates and that's called a pyroxene. I think I have an example. So this is a, um, an example of a pyrosilicate um, called I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Edinburghite? Edinburghite? Um, again, just like physicists like to have fun with their units, geologists and amateur geologists likes to have, like to have fun naming things. Um, has anybody heard of euperite? Euperite is this weird ore mineral that you can find only in the, in, um, in the UP in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Um, and it was first found by somebody from the area. If you're from the Upper Peninsula in, in Michigan, you refer to yourself or others refer to you as a Uper. Um, and so Uperite is actually a particular ore that's only found in the UP that actually glows in UV. So you can actually go out into, uh, and look for rocks at night with UV light, just shine a UV flashlight all over the place and you see a rock that glows, it's Uperite. Um, but anyway, that's why I wind up some funny names on this. I'm guessing Hindenburg discovered this, but um, it's not systematic whatsoever. There's no 
tools for naming stuff in geology. You just put them into classes. It's a lot more, a lot more like naming animals than it is like like our systematic nomenclature for um, ionic compounds. Uh, this one's kind of fun. I always forget this term. An amphibole is when you have a sil two silicate chains next to each other. You can see how you get this sort of like six-sided star. Is it six or seven? Six, yeah. It's like a six-sided star, six-pointed star, uh, where you make these hexagon in spaces in between. And you make this shape, and it just repeats indefinitely in this direction and in this direction, you actually get these really fibrous minerals. It's technically a mineral, it doesn't look like a mineral, um, which is better known as asbestos, is the, the best known example of an amphibole material. Um, fun fact, people don't necessarily think this because we found a way in the 60s and 50s to make asbestos synthetically, but asbestos is actually a naturally occurring material. Um, and it's really not dangerous unless you're breathing it. I will go back to, don't breathe stuff into your lungs. It's bad for you, um, asbestos included. So most of the asbestos on the planet is actually just in the form of minerals and crust. Is it dangerous to breathe in? Like, cause when you're like ripping it apart, is it? Is it because it's easy to break up these chains? Exactly. The chains don't break up, but oh. side to side, you get two of these chains next to each other. Then peeling them apart is pretty easy. But yeah, that's exactly what it's doing at the molecular level. That's why it makes these fibers that are long and stringy in one dimension uh, is because that's the direction that that, that amphibole chain is extending. Um, and we see the same thing in like DNA behaves the same way too. Um, DNA, two strands of it will stick together really well, but you can peel one two-stranded section from another two-stranded section. You can physically peel them apart if you have them set up properly. It's really hard. You have to get like molecular sized tweezers or have some way of attaching one side of it to one molecule, another side to the other molecule, but you can actually just peel them apart. It behaves a lot like asbestos that way. Physically, the material properties are similar. With plate rock, is that kind of like a similar chain form? Or no? Uh, I think slate is more of a phyllosilicate. So, phyllo, I always remember this one says phyllo, it's like phyllo dough. Um, phyllo dough really is pastry dough, really, really thin sheets, right, on top of each other. If you get an extended sheet of silicates, then you get something more like this biotite, where you get these really discrete layers. And so it's slate is a little bit more messier than this, um, but it's got it's similar in that it has lots of layers stacked upon layers. So my guess is that slate is a phyllosilicate. And again, though, what the hell is that? What are we supposed to do with that formula? <laughs> Biotype, 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 biotype. That's why we use common names and not systematic names, right? You didn't see stuff like this much in geology classes, right? Even if you're talking about minerals, you just use the mineral names because who's going to be able to remember that that's biotype if you make it sodium, it's some other name. It's more about, it's it's almost just you know, memor memorization to some extent where you get the general principles, but the specifics are all going to have their own unique names, kind of like enzymes. At least I see a similarity with enzymes, but y'all have not had upper division biochem yet. Um, it is just sheer memorization in some ways. All right, let's talk a little bit more about simpler materials and how they behave. So I guess wrapping up these silicate, the silicate sections, we'll go into things that are more general concepts. What do I expect you to retain out of this? Just some vocab, just general idea that silicates are really important and everywhere, and that there are these different classes. Phyllo, so like, I just put the pretty pictures in because they're cool. Uh, I'm not going to test you on what the formula of biotite is. 
but I might say what's a phyllosilicate or explain the difference between the amphibole material and a phyllosilicate material. And all I'd be looking for is that an amphibole extends in one dimension, but whereas um, a phyllosilicate extends in two dimensions. And so you get more like a piece of paper and less like a chain. Um, carbon also has some interesting properties. It behaves in a similar way to silicon in a lot of ways. We're going to talk about carbon in particular um, and then apply some of the same ideas to silicon because silicon, one, silicon's everywhere, but two, silicon has really interesting electronic properties that carbon doesn't have necessarily um, that make it make silicon more useful in applications like photovoltaics in solar cells. Um, and computer chips. In theory, you could use carbon for a lot of those too, but the properties are not as ideal. Um, but it's a lot of the same properties. So uh, carbon is one of our, our prime examples of something that has two different solid phases. And we really do think of them as being two different phases because going from a diamond to a graphite or vice versa, doesn't change the oxidation state really of the carbon. The carbon has pretty much the same oxidation state in both cases. And so what's really different between these two is just the arrangement of the carbons. And so this is more of a, of a, um, a phase change than it is a true reaction to go from graphite to diamond or vice versa. They're both forms of pure carbon as a solid, but under different conditions, you get diamond versus graphite. So what's happening with the orbitals when we do this? I guess we only have five minutes left. We'll leave band theory. We won't get into band theory today. Um, you guys talk about phase diagrams that were more complicated than the classic one. What's the phase diagram look like? The line. Yeah. yeah. Pressure, temperature. Triple point, critical point, solid liquid gas, right? Well, yeah. If carbon has two different types of solid that are pure carbon, that means we actually have two different solid phases. It's not as simple as just saying everything in this whole section is a solid. There's actually another phase change line in here. And there's a lot of, of different materials that have some weird, not weird, but have um, unique like, solid to solid phase transitions. Any Kurt Vonnegut front fans in here? So ice nine, remember from uh, Cat's Cradle. Um, ice nine is a real thing. There are actually about eleven different phases of ice, where that you can get by varying temperature and pressure. And so you can actually look up. The phase diagram for water. It's actually much more complicated than what we're used to seeing. There we go. That one's nice. And you notice this is actually a logarithmic scale on the uh, y-axis because you have to get to really, really high pressures in order for this to happen. You'll notice that most ice, so the, the red line is standard threshold and, and 100 Celsius and zero Celsius. It's our normal boiling point, freezing point, right? All of these up here, those are all different phases of solids. They're all still solid water, but they have different crystal structures. They have different lattice structures. They're different densities. And getting to these really high form vibes, yeah, there's 11. Uh, there's 15 actually on here, it looks like. 15 different forms of ice. Which one's dry ice? None, because that's CO2. Oh, yes. Um, 
And I don't know if CO2 has, has a phase diagram that's quite this exotic. Um, but in general, carbon, solid carbon is going to have something that looks like this too. And solid sulfur also has, has a couple different solid forms, solid different solid phases. And they're all going to have their own phase changes when you go between them. And you, you've heard of, um, I'm sure, um, the idea that high pressure takes graphite and turns it into diamond. That's true. High pressure and high temperature, you're just moving from one part of this graph to a different part of the graph. And that's enough to cause it to change phase under some circumstances, given enough time. Right. And so we're going to talk about why different shapes, different crystal structures have different electronic properties on geez, what today is it's Thursday today, right? On Tuesday, we'll talk about the different band theories and how semiconductors work. It's Thursday. Well, we have a day. Oh, my God.